Good morning, church. Today is you Sabbath. So for our first song, it's titled Revelation 19 verse 1. It is a scripture song. So as you sing, just know that you will be memorizing scripture for this song. We'll ask you to stand and to sing as loud and as proudly as you can because to this morning we are singing to praise our, our Father in heaven. Oh. Revelation 19 verse 1. Our next song is titled, I Will Never Be the Same Again.
past few weeks we've been studying about how God is able to renew us and give us a new life. And our next song is titled Holy Spirit, and it is through God's Spirit that He is able to renew us and let us start afresh and never be the same person that we were before. Holy Spirit.
Our next song is our prayer song. It's titled, Amazing Love. I'm forgiven because you were prayer so all of you who are willing and able you are welcome to come up here and um, offer our prayers up to up to God together Dear God, thank you for being so loving and so merciful to us that with all the dirt that we have and all the, all the pains that we go through and all the, all the sins that we end up breaking your heart with, Lord, yet you still love us so much that you care not to leave us in that state of sinfulness, in that state of, of dirt. Yet you love us so much that you are willing to change us and make us into something new. And Lord, we ask that you give us that renewing power today. You give us that Holy Spirit power, Lord, that can move and work within us to soar to new heights, Lord, to places where you would like to see us. Lord, we ask that you give us the, 
courage to put all our trust in you, to put our lives in your hands, and just be able to just sit in excitement and amazement to see what you're going to do with our lives in the future. Lord, I have special prayer requests of healing. We have our own elder, Dr. Bill Wright, who is in the hospital. Uh, he's, he's going to be having surgery on Monday. And Lord, we also have Dr. Archibald Dawes that is also facing some illnesses, Lord, and he's going to need a lot of um, help. And Lord, you know exactly what they need. You know exactly what they will need to get to where they need to be. And Lord, we ask that you provide them with the help that they need. And Lord, that you heal them, not only physically, Lord, but spiritually as well. Thank you, God, for being there for us, for loving us so much. And here we are just watching to see what you will do next. In your name we pray. Amen. Next, we will have our children's story. This time, we're going to do something a little bit new and a little bit old. Um, those of you who might have remem remembered some of us, the Shining Stars group, um, we're going to be singing a few of our old songs that we used to sing way back when. Um, the songs that we're going to be singing, the first one is called Hewena, and the second one is Ngayabitwa. And what it says, uh, the first part, it says, we're welcoming you. It's saying, hey, you, come to Jesus. And so um, Antu will be leading out, and then the rest of us will be responding. So we will invite you to sing along with us. So we'll be singing that Hey Wena chorus a few times, and then we'll go right into the next song, which means we will, um, we will wait for our names to be called to enter heaven. Oh, Hey Wena. Helena, 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 Sepile, sepile ma, asara peru, jesu aruna he. Helena, 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 helena,
table so I'm super excited because I have apples okay I have these lovely granny smith apples you see and I got some caramel and this afternoon I was planning on making caramel apples oh you're so good you're so good yes yes okay so I have my apple here but I have a problem can you imagine what it is? I have the caramel. I don't have a stick. I have my caramel ready to go. You know, I've got my pot and I've got my stove and it's going to be boiling, but I can't put my hand in the caramel when it's boiling, right? No, have you guys ever tried to do that? Hurts, no, so I need a stick and I don't have one. But you know what I do have? I got a straw. I got this really lovely, do you guys see this straw? It's, it's an ordinary, you know, simple, flimsy, bendy straw. Like, like the ones that we drink, right? You guys know the straw, right? Yeah. So, do you guys think that we can put the straw through the apple so that I can dip it in the caramel? No, no, not at all. You think you can? Okay, you know what, why don't we, want to give it a try? Do we have any volunteers to give it a try? Let's see, let's see, like this? Any? Perfect, how about you? Do you want to try? Yeah, come, come. Perfect, here, come with me. We'll take the apple and take the straw and see if you can get it through. Do you want to try? Almost, almost, oh! Right. Almost. You got it, buddy. Oh. oh, that's such a good try. Okay. Oh, wow, man. Good work. We, we almost got it. We almost. almost. Got it. Let me tell you something. Heather, we have other volunteers. We'll get there in a second. You know what? Jesus picks Thank out you. ordinary. People, just like you and I. What's your name? You. Caleb? 
Tyler. Tyler. People, Jesus takes out ordinary people like you and I and Tyler to do miracles and extraordinary things. Does anybody know? Does anybody know what the word extraordinary means? What does the word extraordinary mean? You, do you know? It means God above us. It means God above us. What a great answer. Does anybody else want to give a shot of, of what extraordinary means? Zach, I see your hand. Out of the ordinary. Out of the ordinary. How many of you guys think you can make extraordinary things happen? Yeah? Okay, a couple of you have faith in yourselves. So, just like we are like the apple in the straw, we're plain, we're ordinary, everyday things you find in your kitchen, we are just plain people. But God designed us to do extraordinary things. Now, we will not be able to do these great things if we don't have the secret. So there's actually a secret to piercing the apple with the straw. Lisa, you want to tell us what that is? Okay. So, if we cover the other end of the straw with our thumb and push it against it, the air gets stuck inside the straw and it has more pressure. Do you want to try it again? And if not, we can help. You can use your same straw. Go ahead. Now remember to cover this side with your thumb. Okay. I'm going to really... Oh, hold on. I think this one broke the last attempt. Why don't we try a new straw that hasn't been broken? Here, let's put it down. <laughs> straw is bending. All right, Lisa, Lisa, Lisa will show you how it's done. Can I grab a new straw? Here we go. Wow, look at that! Now we can make caramel apples. Yeah? Did you guys believe this was possible? To take an ordinary little straw and pierce the apple? I know you did. You had faith, right? You did. And some of you guys had faith. Caleb, Tyler, sorry. Thank you so much for thank volunteering. So much. Give him a big hand. You can go back to your seat. You. Jesus had disciples. We're going to mention a couple. You guys know who Peter and John were? They were followers of Jesus. And Jesus picked Peter and John, who were simple and ordinary, uneducated men, to do amazing things, like they healed a crippled man. And Pastor Christian will be talking about that today in his sermon. And they also preached and baptized thousands of people. And why were they so successful in doing these miracles? What do you think? Because they had God. Does anybody else think it's a different answer? Why were they, be, why were they able to do miracles? Because they had faith. They had faith in Jesus. Great. Awesome. So, Peter and John were successful because they had been with Jesus. These people walked with Jesus, these people talked with Jesus, and these people believed that Jesus was the Messiah who had saved, had come to save us from our sin. The power of these ordinary men didn't come because they were strong, like Tyler, or they, because they were wise. It was because they had who? Because they had Jesus. And when people realized that they had been with Jesus, they realized that it was the power of Jesus who had allowed them to do these amazing things like make caramel apples. No, just kidding. Pierce, <laughs> pierce the apple with the straw. Jesus has sent you and I, very ordinary and simple people to preach, to heal, and to do extraordinary things in his name. The secret to do it all is to have, to have Jesus. So, I'm going to challenge you. As Pastor Christian, who's sitting over here in this corner, 
with his children. As he talks today in his sermon, I want you guys to pick up on clues to see how people like you and I, ordinary people like James, I mean Peter and John, were able to do extraordinary things in the name of Jesus. That being said, I need one volunteer to pray, and you'll pick up your, vo- your bulletins in the corner. All right, come on up. Dear Jesus, help us have a good Sabbath day. <coughs> and be with everyone in the house. And be with the pastors. And be with Mama, Papa, be with everyone who are Amen. Thank you so much. Have a great Sabbath. And don't forget, pick up on the clues of what it's like to have Jesus in your life and to do extraordinary things. Good morning, Campus Hill family, friends, guests. It is now time to bring our tithes, our offerings, and our gifts to the Lord's work. There was an old man once came into the bank and asked for a loan of $500. The bank employee started filling out papers. What are you going to do with this money, he asked. I will go to the city to sell jewelry that I made. What do you have for security for the loan? I don't know. What is a security? The man said. Well, the security is something that has value and can cover the cost of the loan. Do you have a car? The man said, yes. How old is the car? Uh, He asked. 1949 truck. No, it won't suit, said the bank clerk. Maybe you have livestock. Yes, I have a horse. How old is it? I don't know, because it doesn't have teeth anymore to tell. In the end, the papers for the loan were filled, and the man was given $500. After a couple of weeks, the man came to the bank again with a package of money. He counted the ones belonging to the bank and hid the other ones. What are you going to do with other money? The same clerk asked. I will keep them in my house, the man answered. You can deposit in our bank. I don't know. What's a deposit? The man said. We'll give you the money, well, we'll give you the money whenever you need it back. The old man thought about it and asked, what does the bank has as security towards my money? Let me share with you about the best bank where we can deposit our savings. We don't have to worry about security and safety where there's everlasting growth and benefits and tremendous flow of blessings. Blessings in all shapes and forms, such as friends, family, children, finances, great health. So where is this bank? And the disclaimer is in Matthew chapter 19, verses 19. It's Matthew chapter 6, verses 19. Lay not yourself treasures upon the earth, where moth and rust can destroy, and where thieves can break through and steal. 
But lay up yourself treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust can destroy it, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. I invite the deacons to please stand. Let us talk to God in prayer. Our most and gracious Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for the tremendous amount of blessings that you have given us this morning. Lord, we bring our generous tithes, our offerings, and our gifts for your work. And may our gifts go all the way for the work that's all the way to the ends of the earth. May your coming be soon. Lord, as your man speaks and shares the message to us, may the Holy Spirit we fill us with blessings, joy, power, and your amazing love. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>
Is, uh, is your husband here? Hmm? Is your husband here? Can he lead the closing what I have, song? I give you. Because Bill In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. Thank you, church, and happy Sabbath. The song we're going to sing is titled Touch the Sky. And I really like this song because it really talks about the relationship um, that we can have with our, with our God. And the lyrics that I, I just touches me so much where it says upward falling, spirit soaring, I touch the sky when my knees hit the ground. I mean, when we pray, I can't even imagine how much power and how much um, of God that we can access when we just pause and have that communication with him. So when we touch, when we uh, fall on our knees, we're able to touch the sky.
gift for us as a church to have youth who are so endowed, so talented by our Creator with uh, musical gifts. I have to admit, uh, uh, I share this even with Pastor Julio, I feel like I'm slowly aging and uh, I, I struggle relating to a lot of what they bring in terms of, of these unique gifts. But nonetheless, I uh, continue to appreciate the uh, um, richness of talent that the Lord had invested in our youth. 1.5 billion or 1,500 million is the number that was promised to sort out all of your worries with regard to life, to that which you need to cover your expenses with. But before this 1.5 billion or 1,500 million, there was 949 million dollars that was promised as a reward to the one person or maybe more than one who had those lucky numbers. Well, some people thought they got it. And I wanted to share with you briefly a clip, if my brother Gifford would help me here, the uh, ecstatic reaction to almost having it. So much, yet nothing. 15 minutes of bliss. Wow, this is a hard one. Workers thought that they had won the $949 million Powerball. Watch. It was unbelievable. It was, uh, my legs were shaking. I went to the website at like, now it's 20 after 11. All set of new numbers. Okay, so here's what happened. These restaurant workers in New Jersey, and look at them celebrating, <laughs> jumping for joy as they read the latest Powerball numbers for Saturday's drawing. What they didn't realize though, oh, this is awful. The website actually hadn't updated. And those were the numbers that were drawn on Wednesday. One worker even quit his job, <laughs> and then he had to take back that resignation. And those <laughs> are your headlines. Imagine that. What would you do with all that money? And don't say it, uh, I would give it to the Lord, unless you are ready to give it all, because uh, there were some who did that, and Pastor Shifra will talk about them in chapter 5 of Acts next Sabbath. Their names were Ananias and Sapphira. For every single dollar that you spend, you would have had an additional 1,000 more to spend. We live in a society that over the course of time, had become more and more dependent on the resources that we draw from monetary or material um, sources. We believe that if we had all the money to pay all the debt, we believe that if we had all the money to make all the investments, we believe that if we had all the money to travel, to help other people, to donate, to give to the church, then we would be truly happy people. In the meantime, we struggle with a salary that only helps us from paycheck to paycheck. We find somehow reasonable excuses not to help others, because how can you help others when you cannot help yourself? In the life that we live in this convoluted uh, 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 philosophy of, of, of resources and, and lack of resources seems to get more and more complicated. This morning, I wanted to talk about the debt eraser or where are you looking for help? Open your Bibles with me at Acts chapter 3. We'll read the, five, the, the, the first 10 verses, which Vincer read so beautifully, the, the heart of this passage. Acts chapter 3. We're studying the book of Acts from now until the end of April, and our goal is for this church to be a New Testamental church. There is no way forward, and after 
looking at today's message, we will understand why that need is so imperative. Acts chapter 3, starting at verse 1. One day Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at three in the afternoon. Now a man crippled from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple court. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him as did John. Then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. Then Peter said, silver or gold I do not have, but what I have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping, and praising God. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to be begging at the temple gate called Beautiful, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what happened to him. Very busy life. Fishing, providing for family, paying debt, maybe even helping others. Who in their right mind, smack in the middle of the day at 3 p.m., would disconnect from all of those very important duties and pray? Not only pray at home, but go to the temple to pray, as did many devout Jews. And not only once a day. They would go at 9 a.m., they would go at 3 p.m., And for the third time, they would go at sunset. Who in their right mind at 3 p.m., when you're just about to to, to wrap up, to to put together all of your day's work and and, and finish clock out at 5, who would go to the temple to pray? And the Bible says that just as they were going, At the same time, there was this crippled man that was brought up to that uh, temple's gate. Probably just minutes before them, they could have probably seen the friends carrying this beggar to the temple's gate, which paradoxically is called beautiful. Might have been called beautiful because as opposed to the other gates, which totaled about nine gates in the temple, this one was bronze sheathed, and it was so remarkable, remarkably uh, decorated that pretty much everyone wanted to enter into the temple through this gate. It was beautiful, and yet, at the same time, it was a gate. The main purpose of gate is to separate. And this man, this crippled man, knew firsthand what it means to be sitting at a gate, unable to go past that gate, unable to join the worshipers, unable to be part of the community, of the family in which he hoped and wanted to belong to. You see, probably unknown to us today, Jews did not allow crippled or infirm people to join the rest of the community in worship inside the temple. They had two primary reasons, and both of them highly distorted. First of, one, first of, first of those reasons was based on Leviticus 21, where the Bible tells us that the crippled, the lame, are not to bring sacrifices to the altar or approach the curtain. However, they were allowed and not banned from joining the worship and even eating the holy food. But people just like us back then, in their zeal for self-holiness, they kicked these guys, the crippled, the infirm, outside the gate. They had, by now, various sections in which only certain people would have access. The most outer section was the one of the Gentiles, 
people who are not of Israel, they would come and have access in the court of the Gentiles. Those were the pagans. Then they had the court of women and then the court of men. The beggars were not even allowed with women. They were with the pagans. The second reason why they did not allow beggars, and, uh, uh, that they did not allow crippled men in the temple was based on 2 Samuel 5. Totally distorted. I cannot imagine a, 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 a more uh, preposterous hermeneutics of that verse. David has an issue with Jebusites, and he ironically addresses them as blind and crippled. And from there, the Bible says that an oral tradition developed to where they would not allow these crippled into the palace. But it doesn't talk about the temple. It talks about the royal palace. And yet, in their excessive zeal, they bring that as yet another reason to ban people from joining the worship. They forget that David himself brought a cripple to his table and granted him lifelong royal privileges in his palace. His name is Mephibosheth. They forget that the master himself, and it could probably be, probably be in contrast with Jesus' practice. If you look in, in, in the book of uh, Matthew, um, uh, chapter 21, verse 14, that the lame and the blind came to him at the temple, and that's where he healed them. Jesus breaks these invisible and yet very solid barriers that separated people. He heals them, removes the stigma, removes that which prevented them from joining God in His glory and His beauty past the gates. Even as they were the most beautiful gates, they were still keeping this man, this beggar, outside. Oftentimes, just as invisible, there are barriers in our temples, in our sanctuaries. I remember growing up as a kid, didn't have an instrument at home, didn't have a piano. I really wanted one. My parents couldn't afford one. So I would go to church where they had a Russian organ. That was the only instrument that we had at church. And I would go early on, two, three hours even before church would start, and try to play. And there were a few designated organists called by the church board to serve in that position of organists. Man, I had to run like a... <laughs> when they would come around, it was, it was a, a crime and punishment. You do not touch that holy instrument designated only for people called to do that work. Up until one pastor came, I was just uh, probably 9, 10, an old pastor came to our church, and none of those cold, anointed organists bothered to come on a Friday evening to church, and there was nobody to accompany the, the congregation. Uh, his name was Balan, which means white, Pastor White. And he looked around, and, and, and no organist was there, and they were about to start singing. And he said, Christian, what are you? What are you? And I was all the way back in the balcony there. He said, come here. Nobody starts singing. Come here. He paraded me right in the middle of the middle aisle. He said, you go ahead and play the organ and, and, and play along with the congregation. All the barriers came down. Everything that separated me and, 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 and put me as the outcast came down. Nobody had the courage to ever put any type of interdiction. He said, if anybody stops you, you send them to me. Crippled and begging out at the beautiful gate just because they're different, just because they're not baptized, just because they're too young, just because they're too old, just because they're males, just because they're females, just because they're all of these different reasons to keep them out. And yet, they come to the master. Every time they hear he's around, he comes to them because, to him because they know he could take that away. They know 
The only healing is with him. I love how Ellen White describes the story of this beggar in this book that those of you who are joining our Wednesday night uh, prayer meeting have received for free. And I think we're now out of these books. But she says in her chapter at the Temple Gate, she presents a, a, a very um, a unique piece of information with regard to this beggar. She says, this unfortunate man had long desired to see Jesus that he might be healed, but he was almost helpless and was far removed from the scene of the great physician's labors. His pleadings at last induced some friends to bear him to the gate of the temple, but upon arriving there, he found that the one upon whom his hopes were centered had been put to a cruel death. He arrives days after Jesus was crucified. He missed him just like that. I could only try to imagine, and I know I will never be able to fully comprehend what was going through this beggar's mind. How many times he asked his friends and how many times his friends said, oh, we'll take you, oh, we'll take you, not today, maybe tomorrow, maybe tomorrow. And now when he finally makes it, Jesus is gone. He could have been healed. He could have been one of those that, as Matthew described in chapter 21, he could have been one of those that were healed and now being able to join everyone else in worship. And yet, he made it too late. His God was dead. Have you ever felt that? Was there any time in your life when you wanted so much from God and yet you got nothing and surrounded by loneliness, you wondered, is there really a God? He's helped so many. I hear all of these stories of crippled and, 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 and lame and, 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 and blind and all of them who have been healed. And yet, here I am stuck with my infirmities. And my God is nowhere. The only option that he has left and the only option that we have left when our God is dead to us is to beg for money. We turn to that which we believe is the solution. We turn to that which the society says, if you only have enough, then you will be well off. You will not have any issues. Just get enough of it. 949 million or 1,500 million. Or else said 1.5 billion. Now they're counting trillions and some other things. If you have enough, you'll be good. Hunched down by his infirmities, pressed down by a lifelong depression, with no hope in his sight. This man's vision is limited to dirt. All he could see is the dirt in front of him. All he could hope for is some shiny dirt, which we call today these metals gold and silver. He hopes that from that dirt, if he could only get the, 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 the yellowish dirt, if he could only get the, 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 the silverish gold, the, the, the silverish dirt, then he will be okay. And so many times we find ourselves in a similar situation. If I could only get a raise, if I could only get a promotion, if I could only make it to this point, then everything will be fine. I will do well. Where are you looking for help? Have you ever wondered? We're all looking for help. Where are you looking for help? It's a rhetorical question. Tell me what you're doing Sunday to Friday at 3 p.m. and I'll tell you where you're looking for help. Out of their mind, these people, at 3 o'clock, smack in the middle of the day, they don't look for dirt. They don't look for these metals. They pray. Who prays? Why pray? How could that be any helpful? And they approach this man. And they ask him something. Something very powerful. 
acting as ambassadors of the Most High, they command this man to shift his focus of attention. All this time he was looking down because of his condition. Now they say, look up. Look up. You see, while we waste our time and lives looking down to dirt, God looks at us and asks of us, look at me. I pulled you out of that dirt. I've shaped you in my own image and my own likeness. Look at your image. Look at your creator and you'll become in my image and my likeness the more you look at me. Stop looking down there. Your help is not coming from down there. Your salvation, your healing is not coming from that dirt. Look up. That's your, where your delivery, your redemption comes from. I, I, I don't have to argue this or, or, or provide any, any evidence that we're living in tough times. Everybody knows about that. Yesterday, listening to, to one of the radio programs, they said that what defines this electoral year as opposed to all of the other electoral years that we had in the past is two emotions. They said two, two, 2016, this electoral year, is defined by two primary emotions, anxiety and anger. Two very strong emotions, both of them starting with A, anxiety and anger. As they look at the Republican candidates, as, as they look at the, the Democratic candidates, both parties and the majority of the people are possessed by these two strong emotions. Anxiety, what is it going to happen? And anger, especially when looking across the aisle. They said this country has never been as charged with these two very powerful and toxic emotions. We live in, in, in tough times. The same author who wrote the book of Acts writes in his gospel, the gospel of Luke chapter 21. Open your Bibles with me there and tell me whether or not you see what Luke says in, 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 in chapter 21. If you see that around Loma Linda, if you see that around the neighborhood in which you live, Luke chapter 21, verse 25, the Bible says, There will be signs in the sun, moon, and stars. On the earth, nation will be in anguish and perplexity at the roaring and tossing of the sea. Men will faint from terror, apprehensive of what is coming unto the world, for the heavenly bodies will be shaken do you recognize this type of environment? Terror, apprehension, people growing even higher and higher in their tension. What is to be done? And here comes a promise of $1.5 billion that will take care of all of your anxieties, that will quench your thirst for comfort. And yet, the scripture says, At that time, they will see the Son of Man coming on a cloud with power and great glory. And then, verse 28, When these things begin to take place, do what? Stand up and lift up your heads because your redemption is drawing near. Stand up and lift up your heads. And here is Peter and John saying, Look at me. And extending his right arm, he says, I don't have dirt, but what I have, I'm giving it gladly to you. Get up and walk in the name of the master that you missed maybe by days. Get up and walk. And he jumps to his feet, and now his vision is totally changed. He no longer looks down. He looks up. He joins them, the Bible says, past that beautiful gate into the temple's courts from which he has been banned for years, actually, from his very birth. And the Bible says that from the inside of our mother's womb, we have been banned from the heavenly courts. We're born in that crippled condition that bans us, that keeps us outside the beautiful gate. And somebody is so happy 
that were banned outside until the master comes, extends his arm, and he says, come up, look up. Your delivery is here. You're not to be outside. You're not to be banned at the gate with the unbelievers. You came here for a reason, and your reason is to stand up. Your reason is to be with me in communion, in worship, in fellowship with the brethren. Stop looking down. What are you looking for help? What is the source of your help? I have a good friend in real life and also in virtual life on social media on Facebook. And I'm smiling every time I see a post from this good friend of mine. I will not give you any names, but I brought some of those posts that I wanted to share with you today. And these are beautiful. Uh, just take a look. The first one, the only one who understands me is God. God is my divine designer. At times, he chooses an outfit or a pair of shoes for me. He's just that personal. I have never used an alarm clock. God, my heavenly father, wakes me up every morning to sup with him. God is my divine romancer. He loves me like no one else can. And this is my favorite. God watches over me. He never sleeps nor slumbers. We might be looking away from him, but he watches over us 24-7. And yet the most favorite here, God is number one in my life. My husband is number two. <laughs> and I know that he's okay with that because it's true in his life as well. God is number one in his life and Freddie is number two. Where are we looking for help? What is the source of our delivery? The scripture says, look up. When we look up, we cannot post nonsense. All we could post is all of that beauty which takes place beyond the gate called beautiful. We don't need the beauty of a gate. We need the beauty of what happens beyond the gate. In the temple's courts, in the fellowship, in the beauty and the dancing. You see how this, 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 this guy reacts? The Bible says that he was jumping and dancing all around because he was super healthy, super happy, and super capable. I use this analogy. What would you do if you, if you suddenly uh, 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 discovered that you could fly? Wouldn't you try all kinds of things up in the air trying to see how cool it feels to fly? Well, for this guy... That's exactly how it felt. He was never able to walk. He was never able to jump. So as he comes in the temple's course now, he tries all kinds of, of acrobatics because he's a new being. He is healed. His infirmity is behind him. What are you looking for help? You might be the crippled. Or you might be Peter and John. And there are so many crippled out there. Our goal our vision for this church is to be a New Testament church. Because there's no other way of being in the times in which Luke describes us to be. We're either looking up as these things not only began to begin to happen, they have already began happening. They have been happening. They have been happening here in our backyard. We either look up or we forever stay stuck to this dirt. Ajwa prayed so beautifully. The Lord had made us out of dirt. He had restored us and, and saved us out of that dirt. Now it's time for us to share the beauty of being all full and healthy yet again with everyone who might yet be at that door, at that gate, outside that gate, regardless of how beautiful it might be. I wanted us to close with a song, a powerful song, a hymn called Jesus Paid It All. And uh, at the same time, I want us to keep in prayer those that um, are crippled physically, yet 
very strong spiritually. Um, our brother Bill Wright was supposed to uh, wrap up this song, keep him in prayer as we uh, expect a powerful delivery from the Lord. And I also wanted to bring this uh, uh, very important uh, member of our church family, although she's not here and I don't think she's joined us other than just through the uh, internet. Um, there's another sweetheart uh, who uh, was accidentally injured. Her name is Juliana. And if she's watching us today uh, up north in, in California, we just wanted to, you to know, Juliana, that we're praying for your recovery, for your leg to be healed. And as the Bible talks about this uh, crippled man that was from birth crippled and the Lord had restored his health, we are confident that the Lord is also working on your leg even as we talk right now. Let us all stand up and sing together, Jesus paid it all. I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small, child of weakness, watch and pray, find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe, sin had left a crimson stain. Let us hear the benediction. Dear Lord, we stand in awe as we look at the marvelous price and immeasurable price that you paid for our forgiveness, for our healing. We receive it, Lord, in humbleness. And we want our walk with you on a daily basis to be a beautiful walk in the temple's courts, in the heavenly courts, in the presence of your holiness. Thank you for your healing. 
Enable us to be your ambassadors as we walk out that door, going to various gates of our communities, handing a, 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 a helping hand to those crippled, to those that are yet to know you. In your name I pray. Amen.